last time we talked, I, I talked about regular season and Super Bowls. Yep, like an analogy yep. that I use that you want to have Super Bowl moments in your career, but you want a lot of regular season stuff. And I think that applies towards webcasting that you should be putting content out and distributing across platforms and you should be allowing your fans to access it any way in which way they can. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then you should create some Super Bowl moments where you're like, hey, this is a paid experience. Here's what the experience is going to be. We're mm. covering an album or we're going to be collaborating with another artist or we're going to be bringing the full band back together to do the set. And yes, there's going to be a, a transaction for you to have access to this content. So these are like previews, like these free little glimpses of kind of the live stream. And then the Super Bowl moment is is the full concert that's ticketed, that kind of a thing? Type thing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Did you I think if you ticket everything, yeah. you're limiting the fan that just wants to engage. Welcome to the New Music Business Podcast. I am your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business. Today's episode was recorded live in Los Angeles in my guest's backyard. This was the first in-person interview that I have done since the coronavirus shutdown, and we've all been locked away in quarantine. But Jonathan Azu, my guest, has a beautiful backyard where we could safely socially distance so we set up there, and it was nice to actually be in the physical presence of somebody for once again. I have missed that so dearly. Jonathan Azu, he is an artist manager. He used to be the executive vice president and general manager of Red Light Management. He is also a two-time Billboard magazine 40 under 40 power player. And he just recently, well, I guess over a year ago, uh, launched his own management company after leaving Red Light called Culture Collective. He is the manager for Corey Henry, Luke James, Emily King, Michelle Williams, among others. This episode, we talk about how he's shifted his business model now that live touring is shut down. But we also spend most of our time discussing how the music industry can be more racially diverse and equitable, specifically how music companies can address the racial inequalities that exist at the executive level, but really all levels. And a Forbes 2017 article uh, outlined that hip hop and R&B genres are responsible for 25% of all music consumption and over 29% of all on-demand streams across the U.S. However, executives of color are still relatively scarce atop at major music companies. Uh, I note in the interview, and I've noted this in past articles, that the top 10 out of 10 of the Billboard Power 100 list are all white. And there's only two people of color in the top 50. Azu breaks down why he thinks this is and how to fix this. Because it's a problem. This was a very insightful conversation. I think you're really going to enjoy it. As always, please subscribe, follow, like the show, however you're listening to this. And follow me on Instagram at Ari Herstan. Or you can follow all of us at Ari's Take. That's the same on Twitter or Instagram. Follow Jonathan Azu on his socials. He's at Jonathan Azu on Instagram or at J Azu on Twitter. As always, sign up for the email list that is at ariestake.com where you'll be notified about all future episodes. All right, let's kick into the show. Azu, thank you for having me at your beautiful backyard, your house. This is the first episode that I've done in in person with somebody oh, okay. since quarantine started i've been well, doing thanks. a lot of the zoom so this yeah. feels this feels nice to kind of be in the flash right yeah, now it's yeah it's like in 3d right right, right. in 3d <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of weird seeing people below the waist i'm pretty sure that everyone is just in their boxes when i'm talking to them and, yeah. hologram right yeah right <laughs> it's like much safer right now so we measured it we we're six feet apart uh, no this is cool um so you know it's we're in a really challenging crazy interesting time right now in the music industry and i mean with the quarantine we don't know how long the live music industry is mm -hmm. going to be shut down um i'm curious uh just how you've been doing this whole time how your artists are doing how you're doing um with all touring shut down indefinitely like what is your like day-to-day -day looking like these days yeah i mean you know like everybody we're we're figuring it out by the day. Yeah. Right. And I, yeah. and I think, you know, it's been interesting because I had artists in Asia 
just as it was starting to, to break over there. Oh, wow. Right? Okay. Um, Corey Henry was over there, and Emily King was scheduled to go over there. Mm -hmm. So we were watching this thing from a distance. Yeah. I think we all were watching it. Right. It wasn't that right. much of a surprise. But yeah. We were, we were monitoring it, and really it was just the – there was just so much – I'll call it misinformation, but different perspectives yeah, on yeah. what was happening. Right. right? And right. I'm much more pragmatic. I'm much more, you know, you know, I, I had, I have medical people in my family, so mm -hmm. I can like, I was asking a lot of questions and there were some people in our sandbox of the mm -hmm. artists that were like, you know, it's fake news. It's this, is that. Right. Right? right. So it was just like, who do you believe? And then ultimately the artist is the person at, at risk, right? They're yeah. the ones that actually are going onto a stage, right. doing meet and greets, traveling in the airport. Yeah. Right. You know, so sometimes as team members, it's easy to look at that and be like, Hey, it's all good. Right. Go do the show. Right. And you know, but you get, you're, you're sleeping at home that night and yeah. the artist is out there, yeah. you know, carrying the weight. So, mm -hmm. but, um, but we, we were lucky enough as a company to get a lot done in the first three months of the year. Okay. We had a really right. good first three months with right. the group Grammy nominations. That's right. And we, 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 we developed a partnership with, with, with in grooves and yeah. universal music group to set up our own label system. Nice. We successfully put Luke James album out. We yeah. toured that. He sold out all his dates. Emily sold out all her dates. We were yeah. going back for more. Yeah. Um, we were setting up, tours for this year with Corey Henry was going to do an arena tour with Lenny Kravitz. Wow. Right. Okay. He's supposed yeah. to be in Europe doing arena oh, right man. now. Ah. Um, <laughs> That's uh, rough. You know, uh, Mich Michelle Williams was, was, uh, was, uh, gonna, gonna be doing a tour as well. Yeah. Um, and you know, those both went away. So it's really been, you know, for, for a good six, 30 days, it was like, all right, this is happening. Yeah. What are we taking down? Yeah. Yeah. How are we taking those down? Yeah. Um, what are we trying to shift? Mm -hmm. And if we're shifting them, where are they shifting to? Yeah. Where do we want to plant our I talk about planting a flagpole hmm. and I, I felt like we could maybe reschedule some stuff for November, December. Um of looking this unlikely year. So right this now. March. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I think it looks challenging. Right. Without it being Swiss cheese of a tour. Right. Yeah, right I do right, think right. we will have potentially some markets that will be like, hey, we're good. We're doing mitigation, taking practices within our venues, but we're good to do shows. Yeah. Um, in some capacity, yeah. right? But routing a tour, right? Difficult. Well, I mean, even right now, it's a state by state thing. Exactly. I mean, they just had that show. Chase Rice did a show outside of Nashville like two weeks ago with a thousand people in the venue, no social distancing, mm -hmm. no masks, mm -hmm. and it's like, you know, I, I don't know many artists that would feel comfortable doing that. I sure wouldn't feel comfortable attending a show or doing that, and I would imagine most of your artists probably wouldn't feel comfortable in the immediate future doing shows like that. It's interesting. A lot of people talk about herd immunity. Right. We've all, right? Yeah. It's really, we should also be talking about herd mentality. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. ultimately, we can talk about what should happen at these shows mm -hmm. to protect people mm -hmm. from a public health standpoint. Yeah. But the public has to decide they actually want to do those things. Right. So right. even if they do open back up, it's, are people going to feel comfortable going? I mean, it's not even like if it's legally they can do it. Correct. It's who's going to feel comfortable? I mean, a lot of, I've been talking to venue owners and they're thinking, you know, they're going to be at half capacity even when everything is back up and running. Even when there's a vaccine, it's just are people going to feel comfortable going out to live music? I mean, uh, the concert industry is like probably going to be one of the hardest hit industries just across the board mm -hmm. because that's gathering a lot of people in a small space. Mm -hmm. And so even when, let's say, that, you know, everyone is vaccinated, people are still going to be a little bit skittish. And who knows what venues are going to even be have survived this. Yeah, so it's going to be it's going to be tough. So we, yeah. you know, we worked hard to sort through what was happening. We worked hard to reshuffle things yeah. and plant p flags in the ground of when we thought things would come back and then really start to get a digital mindset. Okay. Of how can we engage with our consumers, yep. with our fans during this bridge period, however long this bridge is to the right. other side, but we have to engage with our fans and set up ways in which we can touch them and they can hear music and really yeah. feel part of what, and, and it, you know, the, the one silver line is we're all going through it. Yeah, you know, exactly. And we're all figuring it out. I mean, and that's the thing is just like everyone is, you know, struggling through this moment and just figuring out what steps to take. What were those conversations like, like with like Corey, who is about to go on a big tour, arena tour with Lenny Kravitz? And he's such a live artist. Like, how is it with him not being able to perform? I mean, what what's an average year that Corey does in terms of number of dates? Like. 150? No, it's like? 150. But it's a lot. Okay. Yeah. It's I mean, global. I mean, this year alone, yeah. Corey, in 2020, 
we would have, I don't can't remember what the, how many countries, but it yeah. was, you know, Korea, Japan, wow. Israel, all over Europe. Yeah. Um, you know, South America. And that's his, like his, his largest revenue generator, I would imagine. It's because, outside the U S and we do a lot yeah. of work in the U S but outside the U S. So it's, it's, it, it, you know, if I was to look for, at this, yeah, I think the international artists that yeah. have international presence and do international business yeah. will have an opportunity to get things back on from a touring perspective before U.S. artists. Right. The U.S. is not. I mean, let's just all be honest with right. each other. Right. We're not. We're not handling this. We're not well. doing a good job right now. <laughs> no, we are we're the number one. Well. Yeah. Yeah. At, no. at all. No. no. No indications. No. In the last two weeks, my 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 mindset has shifted to, honestly, I think it's June. June next year before wow. before US will start to open back up for shows in any sort of way. Yeah. You yeah. know, I, I just don't know how it happens before mm. then. Just knowing all the things that have to take place from a public health standpoint. Right. For, 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 you know, venue owners, I think I'm not a venue owner, but yeah. to feel comfortable doing it. So we'll, we'll see what, what plays out, right? Yeah. Because even when a vaccine's found and therapeutics are found, yep. there's a whole additional runway to getting those to marketplace. Right. And then, and then, you know, reality of it is that, you know, there will be a lot of people that, um, you know, uh, you, you pulled in with the Tesla today, right. which, I, which I love, <laughs> right? You know, but there's a lot of people who are yeah. like, I'm not getting the version one of the Tesla. Right, 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 right. right the exactly. version one of the Tesla. <laughs> that is absolutely true. And I can tell firsthand experience, it is, uh, you know, as an early adopter of this new technology, you're, you are you know, you're feeling it out. You're not quite 100%, 100% right. of the time, so which, yeah. Version but, one yeah. of the vaccine. Yeah, version one of the vaccine. <laughs> Who's going to line up for that? Exactly. So, so who knows what's going to play yeah. out? But ultimately, I think internationally, we're seeing other countries you know it's, it, we, we should as an industry yeah. look out outside the US and learn what's happening outside the US and think about how we apply that yeah the government should be doing that from a public health standpoint right and we should be doing it as an industry how is Japan going back up how is Korea going back up yeah we have a in this country have a sense of so often a sense of, of global arrogance mm -hmm. that we do things the best right the 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 the, the you know, the most accurate. Yeah. And this is going to be one of those situations where other countries are, are and not even, you know, is going to be, it's happening now right. that are leading mm -hmm. um, to recovery faster and better than we are. And we right. have to look to them. So yeah. I, I, I do think that, you know, possibly end of this year, you know, the possibility of sitting over in Japan, mm. you know, for 14 days or seven days quarantining and then doing a residency of okay. shows yeah. could be possible. Yeah. You know, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll see. You know? Sure. Yeah. Um, outside of the live space, what are your artists doing right now? Kind of at home is this a time to is like like writing this year or working on records or like what are they what are they doing it's a hybrid of things i mean yes we're you know if you're if you're you don't have a recording deal and you're you're working on one we're yeah. working to close that if okay. we've, we've closed some publishing agreements with okay. some artists so artists are writing we've opened up recording budgets mm -hmm. for artists mm. so they're recording records so everyone's definitely in a creative space okay uh, okay. zone working yeah. really hard um you know, uh, we have some artists that are, you know, Corey Henry's been doing every Sunday, and this kind of happened organically, but over at Apogee Studios with, with Bob Clear Mountain, the legendary Bob yep, Clear Mountain, yeah. mixing a live session every Sunday. Oh, wow. You know, uh, 3 o'clock, and it's broadcasted across all platforms. Oh, cool. And so we've been doing that with Corey. Nice. Um, we've been fulfilling some of our obligations that we had. You know, Emily, Emily was scheduled to do TEDx, or TED, uh, the TED Talk in... Um, the TED conference in Vancouver, their annual event. Uh -huh. They did do it. They did it virtually. Huh. You know, so we've been executing sure. some things that we had committed to yeah. where we can. Yeah. Um, you know, talking a lot about when things come back on board, what, what are we, how are we positioning ourselves, looking yeah. at product. Okay. You like know, merch? Going, going into the fourth quarter. Yeah. Stores. Yeah. You know, yeah. instead of just having, selling merch on our website, are right. we becoming actually a merch store like thinking oh, okay. about it like seasonal like yeah we are dropping the winter line of sure like a that. fashion brand like, exactly that kind of thing. thinking, okay. thinking cool. how do we engage with our fans in different ways and yeah. more interesting ways because i do believe the artists that do that mm -hmm. the artists that put content out that really 
figure this thing out on how to engage with fans. Those fans will, of course, be the first ones to buy tickets when it when it comes back on board. Right to stay to keep that engagement up mm -hmm. throughout this whole time period. Yeah. I mean, instead of just disappearing um, and going into hibernation or something like that. So that's nice. I mean, you know, I, I think about it's almost like it's. Uh, in some twisted way, it's like a blessing that this is happening now versus 10, 15, 20 years ago where we didn't have the Internet or social media or ways to kind of, you know, digitize our business in any form. And so now we're forced to get much more creative with our business to just keep a business rolling in some respect. But at the same time, even with just fan engagement, there's all these tools that we have now that that people can You're do that. You're absolutely right. Yeah. The, the, dealing with this now versus dealing with this in 1990 right would would be far more difficult right, right just right. just even things such, such as fulfilling a, a merch item right? yeah right you know? ordering the merch item ordering right, the merch item, right? <laughs> you know yeah. imagine if we were all just purely dependent upon mm -hmm. you know you can only buy merchandise by going to a show you can't do it online right you know um because the the bar of entry of selling online is too high it's too mm -hmm. expensive there's too many hurdles to go over so we are yeah. positioned as a society to win yeah, here yeah. to continue to win or yep. figure it out, mm -hmm. right? Um, but you know, it makes it, it still makes it challenging. Have any of your artists been doing experimenting with live streaming or live stream shows or anything like that? Well, we've we, so you know, Corey's doing the weekly. We're not charging the for Clear Mountain thing. Yeah, yeah. We're, it's we're broadcasting it out. We have a tip jar type thing because some sure. people said they wanted to contribute, which cool. is great. Yeah. Um, you know, my my attitude on that it makes sense. And I always I think last time we talked, I, think I talked about regular season and Super Bowls. Yeah, like an analogy yep. that I use that you want to have Super Bowl moments in your career, but you want a lot of regular season stuff, and I think that applies towards webcasting that you should be putting content out and distributing across platforms and you should be allowing your fans to access it any way in which way they can mm -hmm. um and, and and then you should create some super bowl moments where you're like hey this is a paid experience here's what the experience is going to be we're mm. covering an album or we're going to be collaborating with another artist or we're going to be bringing the full band back together to do the set and yes there's going to be a, a transaction for you to have access to this content so these are like previews like these free little glimpses of kind of the live stream and then the super bowl moment is is the full concert that's ticketed that kind of a thing type thing okay yeah, yeah. do you I think if you ticket everything yeah you're limiting the fan that just wants to engage mm, sure so so that's that makes sense it's it's kind of the these are the engagement tools that you're using in this new creative way that that kind of feeds them. Mm -hmm. But then when you do put up that high ticket item, they've felt taken care of this entire time that yeah. they're willing to, to jump in with exactly. that. Exactly. So do you have the high ticket items, those those big Super Bowl moments in the live streaming realm that you're kind of you've we're been working, doing, working on it? it? Okay, yeah, we're cool. For, 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 and I also strategically thought that what you would see in this this kind of bell curve is you would see a few people doing streams in the very when in march march right. april when this hit yes and you're gonna see a ton where people are just gonna be like i don't even know like i remember going to instagram about a five six Everyone weeks was ago live. and it was like all lives <laughs> right. it was insane it's like was what live. do you do with this yeah, right exactly and then you hit the other end of the bell curve where that will go away and then it'll yep. be a, you know premium content mm. i think that that's that's how that works technology is catching up to that right mm -hmm. now too is like i think when this hit there really weren't that many live streaming options that were ticketed that where the technology met the moment i mean one of the very few the only real live, like ticketed live streaming platforms that existed was Stage It, which came out 10 years ago and it was still using the Flash technology and it just like was not really the a, a real a solution that kind of met the expectations of 2020. But now I've started to see a lot more live streaming platforms that are kind of meeting the moment that really went into overdrive to try to you know. Um, just just be that platform for the to meet the needs of all the the artists out there that yeah. want to do this so, yeah exactly yeah so i will see um so i want to back up a little bit um and talk about culture collective um so you had been at uh i mean red light management for how many years <sighs> Many I, years. <laughs> many years. I was You're in New Light. York. I was in New York. So I, I so my, my, my career path was I, um, I, I spent a bunch, a few years at CBS radio corporately in New York. Okay. Working on John Sykes team. I was, I was, that's when I initially joined. I was I just, essentially I just graduated from college. Okay. Right? So was, okay. Um, um, and I worked for CBS, uh, radio, John Sykes was running it mm. and, um, he'd hired a lot of his, 
former MTV Networks friends to come through and help run radio. Okay. So it was Andy Schoen, Greg Drebin, um, David Goodman, who's, you know, actually who initially hired me hmm. out of St. Louis, where hmm. I was living with my parents to come to New York. So I, I credit David Goodman a lot with, cool. you know, getting me where I'm at. Yeah. And, um, and I was there handling music partnerships. So I was the liaison between the label community and our 80 program directors. Of radio stations across the U.S., so okay. I, I, and we were developing programs hmm. that were being promoted through our radio stations, but they were music programs. Okay. And they, were, we were, they were sold to advertisers. Okay. So I built all these relationships with program directors, and I built all these relationships with label executives. Yeah. And this was in the 2000s, and you know, managers were are always very important in the sandbox of the artist. But right. ultimately, then the labels were much more in the driver's seat. Yep. And I left CBS and I went into live events. Um, I joined Superfly okay. uh, Presents. Yeah. Cool. You know, there, there was I mean, there was probably only 10 of us working there at the time. Yeah. And it's more like a startup office <laughs> in in on West 3rd and LaGuardia Place. All right. All you know, right. near NYU. Yeah. And um, at that time, it was just Bonnaroo. And we, right. we, we went on to create other festivals outside lands. Cool. Yeah. Um, Guga Muga, which was a food experience in, in Prospect Park. We yeah. partnered with the Life is Good Company. Oh, yeah. And partnered, and we did the Life is Good uh, uh, family festival, sure. which was really cool because it was for all ages. Where was that? That was in Boston, okay. which is where Life is Good started. Cool. And uh, we developed the marketing group, mm. which is huge business for them today. Mm -hmm. So it was all about how do we leverage the relationships we have with advertisers that are coming to life at our festivals. Yeah. If we, if we can sell solutions to them around the Super Bowl, we can figure out how to sell solutions in the regular season to them. So yeah. it was, hey, State Farm, it's great that you're sponsoring Bonnaroo, right. but let's talk about how we can create other cool things for you as an agency. So we, nice. we started the agency and had amazing years there. Yeah. Still very close with everybody at Superfly. Cool. Um, Corin Capshaw, who is is uh, um, founder of, of Red, Red Light, Light. Yeah. Um, uh, is also an, was an investor in some of the assets that Superfly co -owned. Oh, that's right. And uh, isn't Red Light a co-owner in Bonnaroo? Well, Corin Corn was, was. was an investor in, 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 in Bonnaroo. Got it. And he also does a lot of investments, you know, okay, sure. and, um, it's Superfly and Corin co-owned assets together. Gotcha. Okay. Right? Yeah. And so I got to know Corin really well around that relationship. And, um, and more interesting was that when I was in college, I booked Dave Matthews, you know, so it was kind of like a full oh, right circle on. moment. Like, you Where know, did you go to school? Drake University. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And so it was, it was in, in Iowa in, 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 in Des Moines. Yeah. Where the uh, Iowa caucuses are held. Oh uh, yeah. I played Drake University. It was probably not the level that Dave Matthews was playing. Drake. <laughs> I was at a little, uh, uh, I played your, it was in the student union. It was one of those, that was like the singer songwriter that they would bring in for, you know, like a coffee house series or whatever. Yeah, that's but, how yeah. I got started. I, that's when I was in college. I was, I was the guy at, oh, you, know, you were bringing the music. Bring cool. The music. Oh, bring so you the music. know, right, right. So, um, <laughs> You know, Corin was looking for a general manager to come over to Red Light, and at that time, it, I think it was around 100 artists and um, and um, a handful of offices. So I left Superfly and became GM of, of Red Light, and was at Red Light for a bunch of years. And while I was there, I had signed some artists, and but you know, really was there primarily as general manager. And I was gotcha. kind of like, I was, I was, I was kind of an advocate, if you will, for mm -hmm. the managers while yeah. I was there. You know, and really working with them and how helping to provide them with tools and resources and relationships and networking to help them in their everyday management of their artists. And this was the New York office? I was operating out of the New York office, but okay. I was GM of the company. Gotcha. So at that time, there was New York, LA, Charlottesville, Charlottesville was the Seattle? first office. Or no, that at that time, when I, when, I, when I joined, it was it was Charlottesville, which was the first office, yep. New York, which was the second office, mm -hmm. then there was LA, yeah. um, and then Nashville. So I was, right. I was there when there was four. Okay. I think today, it's, it's Seattle. Seattle in London yeah. is on that. We we rolled London in when I was there. Gotcha. Right. Cool. So um, so that was like mid two thousands or something. Late I, I went over, yeah, late two thousands. Cool. Um, when I went over to to I'm trying to think. It's like in time. Right. Um, um, actually, it was, it was it was actually yeah late late two thousand early yeah. two thousand ten or something cool. like that. Right. And then um, so so yeah, I went went over to Red Light. You know. Uh, 
signing some artists, but also there as, as GM was in working out of New York in the same building that ATO Records is housed out of. So I sure. built a really great relationship with the team at ATO. Yeah. You know, we did a lot of amazing things. I mean, it was really neat. I mean, probably one of the more memorable things working out of that office was the Alabama Shakes and the fact that management and labor were in the same building. And I was there when they essentially signed them and to watch mm. the growth of that, wow. that band. Yeah. Know, it was just really neat to watch amongst a lot of other things. But that was right. a really, a really fun one. And it's, it's still brings back good memories when I'm playing their albums at home sure. thinking, you know, some of the small, tiny shows they were doing back then at wow. Mercury Lounge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh, for sure. <laughs> right. And then, uh, right, I caught their Greek show. I, I want to say it was like probably 2016 or something. It was like right when they were, uh, I think that was the year they were nominated for everything at the Grammys. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Or maybe it was like right before that or something like that. But, yeah, they're, uh, yeah, that was, I mean, that's great. It's like that's a true kind of red light ATO um, collaboration, mm -hmm. one of the ones that really popped. Really popped, great. yeah. yeah. And then you throw in the Bonnaroo and the festivals. It right. all really, ecosystem of red light really, mm. you saw it come together with that particular artist. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I decided to move to L.A., um, with my family uh, for personal reasons, but also, you know, I, I started seeing a lot of stuff shifting this way sure. out West. And so we, we, we made the jump out here. I took a step out of the G, the general manager role yep. and started working with red light just around my clients mm -hmm. and started thinking around, you know, just having a lot of self-reflection, you know, mm -hmm. about my career and people I had met with and people that have been influential into where I'd gotten in my life. And, um, the fact that I was often the only person of color that was in a lot of these meetings mm. in my career. Um, I was the only person of color at a lot of these these high level, you know, curated events where they're bringing in the president and CEO of this label and this and that. And you're sitting there and you're saying what well, once used to be, I guess that's the way it is because I'm just living in it. Right. Was I think I understand why it is. Mm. And now the question is. Do I want to be an example of somebody that breaks that cycle and yeah. says, you know, you can be an owner of your own business and mm. be of color. You can you can um, develop ways in which your company is structured to help break systemic issues that are out there that help that that really prevent uh, diversity and inclusion from happening in our industry. Mm. Not always intentional. Sure. Right. Right. You know, and I think that's the one shift that we're seeing now versus before this year was that, I, you know, not in a million years would I ever th think that a lot of people I worked with would ever think that diversity and inclusion is not a good idea right. or they wouldn't believe in the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah. But what were they actively doing to themselves to yeah. help provide a better, you know, a better, uh, you know, structure to prevent these things from happening? Right. And they also manifest themselves in different ways. Sure. The George Floyd killing was an acute manifestation of systematic racism that led in death. And it was very shocking for everyone to see, but right. you know, the manifestation of systematic racism comes to life in other, many, many other ways yeah. in society and also many, many other ways within our industry and many, many other ways within these companies in our industry that has pledged to get behind the movement mm -hmm. have to look within. So I wanted to be a company. This was a year ago, March right. that really embodied these, these, um, values into our mission statement mm -hmm. and we launched and that was part of our part of my you know my story of when i launched i was very right. public about it yep. and i wanted to walk in it i yep. wanted it to be me and my vision and it's been interesting that literally a year late, later almost to the date of launching um covid hits and then a few months later the george floyd killing happens and mm -hmm. then you know you, you know then from there and it's been interesting because it's just i've been talking a lot about it you yeah. know you know um not just publicly on platforms but i've gotten calls from colleagues yeah you know um at red light cbs superfly saying you know let me check in i want to check in on myself as an individual yeah so how can i do better because mm. i know somebody from white colleagues correct who are, who are somebody looking, i worked with that yeah. i respect i look up to yeah. and i know why you left red light i know why you started culture collective and i know what you're what you're trying to do yeah what can i do as an individual to be better and be more self-aware and, and so 
it, it's been it's been cathartic for me because yeah. I like to talk a lot about it. Yeah. You know, because yeah. I think if we can have these conversations, even right. if they feel uncomfortable, it, it it pushes you towards progress. So, what are some of the suggestions? So, when these white colleagues call you and they're asking for guidance, or they're asking for to check in, or just to see how you're doing, but also how can we be better as an industry? Um, what are some of your thoughts on that, and what do you kind of uh, talk to these colleagues about? I think you know, ultimately. I mean, it's a, it's a variety of things, but right. the, the first and foremost is rec recognition. Sure. Saying, all right, you know, I, the, the, I, I, re I now recognize, and whatever that epiphany was, I yeah. now recognize that I need to do more mm. as an individual in in the self, this being self aware of the shoes that you walk in as 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 someone not someone of color sure. versus somebody that is. Yeah. And um, that's the first step. Mm -hmm. ultimately and the second step is is recognizing that you know like it or not right um you know you're part of the problem yeah you know yeah and and it's not always with intention part of the problem right mm -hmm. it's sometimes not with intentions it can be something as little as as you know hearing something and not saying something about it right. we're seeing that a lot that's why social media is exploding yes because people of all races are saying, I'm not going to stand for what you just said to that patron over there. Right. And, 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 and versus that's not my fight. Right. And I mean, it's, it's, that's part of the privilege that white people have where we don't have to acknowledge it and we can kind of operate in our own little bubble and, and just pretend that there isn't a problem because it doesn't directly um, inhibit our upward mobility or, um, you know, in a sense that's obvious or, or it just, it's, it's not a problem that white people have to acknowledge on a daily basis. And so we can pretend it doesn't exist. Correct. And so I think that, you know, that's been something that I have been, you know, focusing on the last few months is just trying to see how can I, um, Start with the acknowledgement. Start with acknowledging white privilege. Start acknowledging all of the privileges that I have as a white male in the industry and just in society. But then looking at like where, like where's the best place to like what is the best role for someone for any of us and any of the um, to kind of have in this in this place. How do we effectively move not just the conversation mm -hmm. forward, but move the industry forward in a more equitable place? Mm -hmm. And like, I think we're all trying to figure that out right now. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because I think that that our industry is 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 um, you know there's there's a term progressive white privilege that I that I was was brought to my attention relatively recent, right? Because I've always thought of it as white privilege. And, yeah. And progressive white privilege is that is that individual that. Again, I, and I think it's a lot in our industry that would never ever think that DNI is not a good idea. Would never ever think that the killing of George Floyd was justified. Mm -hmm. um, would never, you know, you know, s supports Black Lives Matter, puts the sign up in the window, right. uh, 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 post in solidarity right. on, on Blackout Tuesday, right, right, right. Um, you know, encourage their company to take Juneteenth off, sure, right. Um, but would n would never say that that they're part of the issue mm. uh, because they are in support of or don't believe in those things, right? But there's a whole host of other things right. that they may say, well, but yeah, you know, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to hire uh, a director uh, underneath me mm -hmm. and, you know, nobody of color applied. So, you know, I just kind of went with Right. The person that I felt comfortable with. Right, right. right. And so, yes. So yes. it's this kind of like mm. progressive of like, I'm progressive enough to know that those things that I mentioned before yeah. are not right hmm. or or need to be fixed because they're, they're not very acute and they're very public facing. Yes, yes, right? yes. Kenning the Ken and Karen stuff, <laughs> right. social media, right? Yeah, yeah. But when it, when you, when, you, when you start to unpack some of the other things, mm -hmm. they're not as willing to say that that's an issue. So you're leading by example. You're running your own company. Um, you know, it's you, you have a. Um, um, I think it's an all black roster. Um, and it's, how do you, like, how would someone else in like, uh, uh, your white colleagues that are in those positions of power kind of 
actually do the work and not just pay lip service to the movement. I mean, I'll give an a, one that really stuck with me when I was starting my company. Yeah, was um, was that I think the companies I've worked for and other companies in the industry have always done a really great job of hiring interns. Okay, to, to that eventually become whatever assistant, right. yes, office coordinator, and then become manager or director or right there's a pipeline there yeah right yeah and you know i've always noticed that the diversification in the internship pool is always like you know wasn't great hmm. right you'd look at it and say well, what's the deal here mm -hmm. and i started really unpacking the fact that we don't hire our interns yeah i'm sorry we don't pay our interns ah uh. right and if i'm you know economically challenged that i can't over the summer Pay, mm -hmm. pay to fly someplace, New York or LA, right. put myself up and work for free, yep. I can't, that's not an option, mm -hmm. right? And the reality of it is that the overwhelming majority of those that are economically challenged are people of color. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So now that internship program is now going to go to most likely somebody not of color that's mm -hmm. affluent, that right. can afford to do it. Right, right. There's your pipeline right there. Mm. And then you ask yourself, well, you know, we hire within or we hire which, 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 who's we, within arm's reach. Right. And they tend to tends not be diversified. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, I mean, that's a great I mean, real life example. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, and you're part of the uh, so there's this uh, organization that has started the Black Music Coalition mm -hmm. um, and it's it's black artist managers that have kind of come together what what is this yeah so Talk it was de it was developed bit. by by Binta Brown uh, who's an uh, attorney with with a political background but also uh -huh. works with uh, with artists okay um, had put it together and basically there was a zoom call at some point in time with a bunch of managers and we were discussing what what, what, what can we do and yeah and there's multiple missions or charges that the organization has okay but one of the primary ones is holding these companies accountable. Mm. You know, so we all watched a lot of companies post on social media. You know, they cut a lot of checks, right, a lot of right. checks, a lot of checks flying around. <laughs> yes. Right. Okay. And then now it's what, what, where's the accountability? Sure. Cause if, if, if these companies would have held themselves accountable, we wouldn't be where we're at. Mm. Yes. And since they're private, you can't self police. You can't self police. Right. Right. And if you, I'm just making this up, but if, Company A says, hey, we're going to diversify our C-level executives. So going forward, our goal is to, you know, make sure that within three years, 20 percent of our executive, you know, C-level executives are people of color mm -hmm. and they only get to 10 percent. Mm. What happens? R right. Right. Yeah. Right. So we're, we're working to develop ways in which we can hold those companies accountable. OK. To the best of our capabilities. And, and hopefully also, too, sometimes it's not just us coming in and saying, hey, you know, shows what you're doing yeah. it could be uh here's who you should be working with mm. to help you get there as a company i do believe that the bigger the institution yeah. well all institutions but definitely these big institutions they need to be do hiring outside bringing consultants in mm. to help really look at what they're doing unpack that restructure it create safe environments for employees to talk about these things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and um and then really have that self self-evaluation you know and then i also really think Compensation be should be tied to this in, in some way? form or fashion. I have trouble really if, – if you're 65 years old and you're a chairman or chairperson of a company, yep. right, and you're saying in the last three months, I really think that diversity and inclusion is something that we need to take seriously at my company, yeah. right? right, and I'm going to cut checks and we should do this. Mm -hmm. I really feel that in order for you really to care, your compensation should be tied to the metrics that you lay out. Mm. For your company to get the diversity inclusion benchmarks yeah right so your bonus your your salary however you want to look at okay it, yeah compensation sure. at that level right should be a part of that accountability and you'll start to see some change it needs to be felt emotionally <laughs> don't right. get me wrong sure you sure. gotta buy in yeah you gotta want to do it yeah. i'm not saying it's all about the money but ultimately too a lot of these companies should be compensation should be a part of that right yeah. um and then i think what's and I also think what's happening, and I and I tend to think that's maybe for the older executive that came through this industry with a lot of systemic issues and now is on the sunset. Mm. And you're trying to think, why is that 
executive on the sunset just now having an epiphany. Right. Is the change really going to happen? I do think there's a groundswell mm -hmm. of younger executives coming into this industry that do want to make sure that it, it, it not only do they want to make sure that the companies that they work for mm -hmm. are doing these things, mm -hmm. they won't work at companies that don't do these things. And, and is there a way to make this accountability public? Is there like a database that could be publicly listed saying, here are the companies? Like I was looking at the Billboard top 100 power players. Mm -hmm. The top 10 are all white. Um, the top 50, I, I think there was only one or two black people. John and, Platt. And the, right, right. And there's like four, <laughs> and, four uh, people. And the other person. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. but that's... That and, it's, it's, and, and by the way, it's something... So I go to Billboard Power 100 every year. Yeah. And it, it, it it's talked about in that room. Yeah. With, when I run into the other black executives in that room, yeah. we talk about it. Yeah. I don't know if the, all the other white executives realize we're talking about it. Right. right. We talk about <laughs> it. This is true. Yeah. Right. You right. know, it's yeah. really true. And it's not that, hey, Billboard, go... Go pick executives of color so you can have better representation on your list. Yeah. It goes deeper than that. Mm -hmm. What's going on at these companies to where, right. these, where, where people aren't put into the position to have a shot at being on that list? Right. I mean, it's like you can't just say, oh, we're going to exclude Universal because it's run by a, a white guy. It's like, well, no, Universal is still one of the most powerful music companies. And the person who runs that is going to make the billboard mm -hmm power list and so it's like and same with all the other companies and so it's just like when you're looking at who's running those companies and so that's more hurtful what's more hurtful to the movement is somebody saying the the solution is let's just, just not put Lucian in there let's just put somebody else in there because right. they're of color and we solved it right yes. you've got to unpack and the unpacking of it is well why is it that there's only these, to your point, white executives yeah. that are at the very tops of these companies. You know, you know, on down to, hey, our internship program's not right. Right, because you don't want to just put a Band-Aid on this bullet wound. Exactly. And by That's just replacing it, it's like, all right, Lucian, sorry, you're gone. We're putting in uh, some black person just mm -hmm. so we can, like, check this off. Mm -hmm. And then the system systemic issues are still maintained throughout the yep. entire yep. ecosystem of the company. We saw that with busing in, in schools, mm. right? I went to a school that was 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 desegregated by busing and and you know it, from a statistical standpoint it it you can look at it on a paper and be like oh we solved we now have six percent of the school population right. here is of color right yeah. because yeah. we bus students in but when you really were in the lunchroom yeah it wasn't working so i'm curious if you think that there could be a way i mean internship programs uh, that's something i hadn't thought of and that's like a really illuminating um and and concrete change that people can make is shifting the internship programs to be paid internships and then also recruiting um outside of your normal recruitment tactics mm -hmm. i'm wondering if it can start in other areas um like in communities um like at, at universities or even in at the high school level, um, kind of encouraging um, or just educating in a way that that this can be kind of a mentorship program in some way. Um, ha, is any of that like explored or, or is that something that that would possible be possible? Not explored enough. Yeah, I mean, there should be mentorship programs. There should be when you're you're you know through these internships recognizing who are the the standouts and who are the ones that. We should be carrying to future semesters, mm -hmm. um, summer semesters, or semesters of internships, yeah. and then eventually graduating and having two or three mentors through internship programs that right. now can help place you in the industry. Mm, yeah, yeah. The pipeline. We have to actively right. walk in our practice of breaking systemic issues. Right. You have to really think how is it going to be done and what are the systems that we're going to set up. And again, mm. cutting checks is fine. But if you're not thinking, how do I invest, take that money and mm -hmm. invest in what we do as an organization, you're missing the mark. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm I'm curious about, you know, there's been a lot of talk about reparations um, in society. I mean, I, I read um, Ta-Nehisi Ta Coates, uh, The Case for Reparations uh, from The Atlantic that he wrote, uh, gosh, it must have been maybe five, six years ago, something like that. That's more about uh, reparations for the entire society, America. I'm wondering if there's a way that 
that could work within the music industry in terms of just like it's almost like a reinvestment. It's like, you know, I I, I was um, I don't remember what this was from, but like I was learning about, you know, after um, World War Two, after the Holocaust, Germany paid reparations to Israel, um, to the Jews and was part of the way because they're like because they pulled um it, they felt morally that this was the right move to make to invest in a community that they not just disenfranchised but actually completely oppressed and they paid reparations to Jews in Israel and that was part of the reason that Israel thrived so rapidly. I'm wondering if there's a way that reparations, if you think it, there's any place for that, if that should be looked at in music at all and what that he would even look like it's interesting because your you know your example is a societal right, right. versus industry right which is when within the industry you have you know we're in america so we're built on capitalism right and um and uh and this country was built you know, it was built on racism. It just right. was just right. flat out, right? Yes. Um, starting with the Native Americans. So I almost feel like I think it could work, but we it, it, it should start. It, it should holistically it would have to start a societal level okay. and then trickle down into industry huh. to have wide, wide impact. And but that being said, yeah, I mean, I it, how interesting would it be if record label – Acme Co., whatever, mm -hmm. you know, Acme Co., right, whatever, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. stood up and said, listen, the agreements that we cut with artists in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and in some cases the 80s and 90s mm -hmm. were not fair. Right. And we are publicly going to say that they were not fair. Mm -hmm. And even we're publicly going to say the estates of this artist or that artist, your, your deals were not fair, mm -hmm. and we're going to restructure those. Mm -hmm. That would be amazing. That would be amazing, and it would be it would be a step in the right direction. But it yes. would also be an example mm. of a company saying, recognizing what I talked about earlier, yeah. recognizing that they were a part of the problem. Yes, right. It's that acknowledgement, and that's right? what's instead. Needed, yes. Instead, a lot of companies would rather say, "Well, let's not talk about the past. Let's talk about the solutions that we put in place." We we now take Juneteenth off. We cut a million dollars to color and change. Right. You know, we posted in solidarity. Right. We're not part of the problem. Yeah. Progressive privilege. Right. Right. And that's because it, it has to affect the bottom line in the business. And that's that's where the uncomfortable conversations need to happen and where there's going to be the most amount of pushback um, is when you're saying, well, we're going to pull from all of your revenue, from your salaries and from your bottom line and right the wrongs of the past of what we have done as an industry. Um, on, and, and you start with, I, I like that looking at the, the deals, um, with individual artists, but then even, I mean, cause it's, it's the reinvestment and that was kind of, you, you were mentioning before, um, that's what we, you know, when in society, we're exploring that. That's what the defund the police movement is all about mm -hmm. is taking money from over here where we're overfunding police right now and investing that into community, specifically communities of color to build up the community. So the policing is not as needed because we have social programs that are now supporting. So it's the community supporting itself, but we're taking the money that traditionally has gone into policing those communities and then helping build it up. It's like a different, it's that, it's that reinvestment reallocation. reallocation. Exactly. I'm, I'm trying to see if there's like some kind of parallel that could work in the music industry. Um, similar to how we're thinking about that, because it's like, you know, the, it's, it's like, it's not just enough of cutting every executive salary and like putting that to the artist's yeah. baseline or like, let's give them a few more points on their <laughs> record deal or whatever. But yeah, I, I don't know. And, and I'm just like, cause I think everyone, well, uh, most people acknowledge that there's a systemic issue and there has been from that pipeline, from the internship program, all the way up to the executive level. And all you need to do is look at the billboard power list to see there's a problem here. And, but even in every boardroom, like you mentioned, it's, it's very obvious but then when music 
when the charts are dominated by black artists and it's um you know it's like black culture is dominating just american pop culture there's such a imbalance there and like i'm yeah i yeah i'm, I'm just like I, I i it's it's like i'm at a loss to kind of see what are what are the steps that like on an individual level because if you're looking at it like systemic level it's like okay there's only how many of the executives can like make those executive decisions saying all right we're changing this we're doing this this and this but like is there something that individuals in the music industry can do specifically the white individuals that would just I don't know, in your opinion, that that would help the movement. Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, helping mobilize, right? You know, okay. um, communication is key. But like I was saying before, it's like, you know, if you're working at a company that's, you know, embracing these kind of practices and not being self-reflective mm -hmm. and being progressively privileged about it, um, high-fiving because you posted on social media, you right. cut a check, tell me you don't rock with them. Yeah, you know? Yeah. And there's no better time than right now. That's the other thing that's interesting, right? That, with, that this intersection that we hit of COVID and the conversation around race, it came at a time where, you know, you, you could probably be more vocal than you've ever felt before. Yeah. Where you work, especially in our industry. Yeah. What are they going to do? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fire you? Right. Right. You're right? Yeah. Uh, what are they, what are they going to do? Uh, you know, everyone's vulnerable yeah so it's like the perfect time you know mm. we're all not touring yeah. we're mostly home yeah we're working from home we're having these conversations um you know i and I, listen i think companies are scared to a certain extent i think yeah. that's why you saw so you saw so much activity with posting and cutting checks yeah because nobody wanted to get called out right but i think that's dangerous like i said before that's the equivalent of putting the black lives matter poster in your window and then going and voting how you vote or hiring how you hire that next day, mm. you know, that that's a very facade thing. Right. And, um, but if you work at these companies or you're an executive at these companies or you're an officer at the companies, you got to stand up and say, listen, this, this is not how it should be. And this yeah. is the perfect time to do it. Yeah. We have a runway between when we're actually going to be all busy again, where it says, you know what, I really think this is important, but we have this immediate short term need of a tour going up or, you know, like we have a runway right now. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's, it's, I feel like it's, it's really, yeah, like you said, I mean, it is the perfect time to be having these conversations. And, and um, I, I think that was the biggest challenge before is like, even if people felt like there was injustice in their company, the lower um, the, the totem pole you are, the more, the less empowered you felt to speak out because it's like, then you're deemed difficult or you're challenging the status quo and you don't really have that power to do that. And now, uh, people are feeling more empowered. And, um, so yeah, I mean, hopefully we're going to start to see it's, it's obviously going to be incremental, but, um, you know, some companies are coming out like, uh, you know, the distributor STEM, the independent distributor, uh, Milana Rapkin, she's the CEO and, and, they were one of the very few companies that not just made a, a Blackout Tuesday uh, show must be paused post, but actually took a couple weeks and looked into the entire structure of their company and said, you know, we failed. We failed at the executive level. We failed in our hiring practices. And they put out like a step by step plan of how they were going to uh be more inclusive and active in their hiring practices and just like mm -hmm. focusing on that. And, and, you know, it was nice to see that they're willing to take those concrete steps and not just kind of move on businesses as usual, you know, a few weeks after the noise has kind of died down. Yeah. And I wasn't aware of that. And I applaud her for, for taking that action. Cause I always say that these things are much easier to talk about, um, now than when there's a crisis. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 Uh, and the, and crises have come to life now when you get called out or somebody says, you know, uh, it was, there's a Los Angeles time article, uh, a, a, about a week ago. I don't know if you saw it. I, I, and I can't remember the, the company that this woman worked at, mm -hmm. but the title of the article was, um, entertainment company, uh, uh, says they, they believe in the black lives matter movement. Uh -huh 
former employee thinks different. Right, right, right. Former I black employee that. thinks right. different. <laughs> I did see that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? So exactly. when it becomes a crisis, yeah. because somebody says, ah, 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 yeah. you know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to publicly talk about the things that you were doing as a company, right? Mm-hmm. Then it's like, oh, let's rush and get something out. We're going to fix this, right? Yeah, yeah. Be proactive about mm-hmm. it. Yes. And not just wait to get right called out. Don't wait till it's a crisis. Yeah. It's much more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm concerned similarly that like, as we've all been seeing, you know, right when the protests started after George Floyd, um, everyone's very active. There's a hundred thousand people on Hollywood Boulevard protesting. And, you know, I, you attend the protest and it gets fewer and fewer people People are talking about it less and less on social media, and then it's going to kind of get into kind of business as usual again. Um, are you noticing kind of people losing interest? And if so, I mean, even with the Black Music Coalition, is this something that is going to kind of keep those companies held accountable in a way that's ongoing and to have the regular check-ins? And I'm uh, yeah, hopefully you get to a, a one day where it's not needed, right? You know, and that you know that's being been worked on for decades right multiple civil rights leaders and you get better and better right yeah it, we, we, we do have progress in society so something's happening at a societal level yeah um and yes distractions exist yeah you know be it the covid uh you know resurge or be it Kanye 2020 distractions <laughs> distractions will be out there right. so you have to stay focused yeah. and keep pushing it into the forefront and making sure it's at the top of conversation mm-hmm. and only time will tell this time next year when we're all kind of hopefully comfortably getting starting to, to get back into a normalcy around industry things mm-hmm. whether or not we're pushing it forward mm. and addressing it I do believe that I I do believe and I and I and I hope that executives at all different levels feel that they can bring it up and talk about it mm-hmm. without risking their, you know, their jobs, yeah. you know, real talk, right? Yeah. Um, you know, risking confrontation. Yeah. They can bring these things up and they can be talked about yeah. um, once things come back on board. And I, and I, and I feel that's going to happen. I really, really do. I feel that's mm-hmm. going to happen. Yeah. I hope so. And I, I think it's, it's you know, we want to look at this as not just a moment, um, but actually a way that can be um, integrated into uh, the, the just the fabric of every yeah, day. Yeah, absolutely. Right. right. Mm-hmm. And and that's yeah. And w- I think a lot of us like um, white allies have been kind of just trying to figure out how do we help like amplify the the black leaders and their voices and just try to be like supporters of this movement and like integrate this into our daily lives and you know just help keep this keep the momentum going so it doesn't just die out because i mean i fully acknowledge that it's it's very easy for me to just kind of pretend this doesn't exist because I'm not forced with acknowledging on a daily basis. But now it's, you know, now that like the wool has been pulled over, you know, away from my eyes, I'm just like, oh, now I don't feel comfortable not acknowledging it on a regular basis. And like, I'm just trying to find ways to just like help, you know, move this movement forward effectively. Yeah. And then on my end, as a person of color, yeah, it's, it's, it's um, not pretending that that didn't hurt what somebody said, right? Right. It's not. It's it's, mm. it's 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 not. You know, pretending that that didn't that didn't make me fearful. Yeah. What somebody said or mm. did, right? Yeah. And that's the part that we in our in our in our society, but in our industry, need to push forward on exactly what you just said, exactly what I said. We have to get comfortable with that. Yeah. And I and I, I when I look back at my career and I look at things that times that I felt hurt or uncomfortable because somebody said something or did something yeah. and I didn't say anything about it. I you know, I do look at myself as much as I look at them that what could have been done better in that situation. Mm. Yeah. Sure. And it's 
Yeah, I mean, it's uh, this is like a, the reckoning that I think society needed to have, but also our industry has needed to have for a long time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, well, um, that's great, and I and I appreciate kind of you know being able to have these this conversation because it's it's something that like I think for so long people weren't having. A, white people weren't having like uh, you know like you were saying when you're in the room with the billboard power 100 and it's like it's just a few black people and it's like you're having those conversations but none of the white people um are having them so you do have an all black roster now was that in Intentional when you're kind of signing artists, was that part of the Culture Collective um, mission statement to amplify artists of color, um, or is this something that is kind of um, just in your personal taste, or or how that all works? I, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's definitely part of the mission statement of the company. But okay. the reality is, I was before I started Culture Collective, I'd worked primarily, you know, with black artists that were that fell under my responsibility at Redline. Of course, I worked with everybody. Yeah, right. Um, but, you know, the mission statement of the company is to embrace those that are that are that are, you know, it, you know, using music as a channel to express their culture. Hmm. And, OK. And, and, yeah. and cool. And, um, you know, I, th I think it's important and I've always thought it was important that artists of color have the opportunity to sit across the table from a manager hmm. that looks like them. Yeah. It doesn't mean it has to be that way. Sure. But they should have the opportunity for it to be that way, mm. and that is what was missing at a lot of these big box management companies. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, and, um, and again, I'm not saying those companies were doing it intentionally. Right. Right. I think they were very much doing it unintentionally. Right. But it goes back to what are the practices that those companies are doing to fix that issue. Sure. And you know, um, when I started Culture Collective. It wasn't that I couldn't have done Culture Collective at, a, at another company and said, let's do this together. I wanted to, it was important for me to do it, one, because it would be my narrative, mm. but also it was important for me for young executives to say that somebody could do it. Mm. Somebody could, somebody could, you can, you can start your own company. You can leave working at premier companies and go do your own thing yeah. and do it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a way that's respected and be professionalized and well put together, you know, it, it can happen. You can do it. Yeah. Um, and I, and I honestly think in this post COVID world, yeah. Um, holistically, we're going to see much more independent boutique companies, especially in management. So that's interesting. That's something that a, a, a lot of people are kind of thinking about what is going to shift from post COVID. Why do you think that? Why do you think that we're going to, the, the boutique agencies will start up and, and like the big box management companies won't. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I think, and I, th and, and I, and I think it's gonna happen in management. I think it's gonna happen in a lot of different industries, including outside of music, because I think sure. what you're having right now is everybody is, there is an element of too small to fail from a governmental standpoint. Okay. Right. Well, 2008, 2008 was too big to right. fail. <laughs> yeah. Right? That's when yeah. Bear Stern went under and yeah. AIG. Yeah. AIG and, yeah. and then this administration has really used this crisis as an opportunity to make sure that the, 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 the small business owner is taken care of in a way that their business can, can thrive. And I'm not saying it's by any means remotely perfect. Right. Cause we don't know what we're dealing with. Right. But there is an element of, Let's make sure that these smaller businesses are taken care of. So, but in order to take advantage of those situations, you really have to have structure around your business and mm. what you do. Um, but the the when you are a business owner during a situation like this, you know how much money's coming in, you know how much money's coming out, you know how you can lower your expenses. Mm -hmm. It's your business. You know you can work directly with your bank in setting up these programs to help save your business. Right. If you're working for somebody else. Right. Yeah. Um, you're hoping they get it right. Yeah. Right. You're hoping they get it right. Right. Yep. And when you're working for a service based company, not like a product based company, like, you know, Spotify. Mm -hmm. Right. When you're working for like we, you know, service based. You're really, really hoping they get it right because mm -hmm. it trickles down. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, that essentially that company is your partner in your business. So you're hoping that your partner gets it right. And I feel like the more control you have over your business, the more you can make sure it's done right. And I think that coming in 
into a post-COVID world, a lot of it was already happening before the whole gig economy and the ability for you to start your own company, right. and hang your own shingle, and have your own logo and have your own brand. You know, yeah. you know, was a thing. Um, the one thing that was missing there with a lot of people was like, well, I don't want to take the financial risk. Or I don't want to take the business risk. Or I don't want to learn how to do the accounting and all that stuff. I don't want to do any of those things. I want someone just to do it for me and let yep. me know every quarter, or every year where I land. Yep. But now you go through something like this and you're mm. like, boy, I hope they make the right decisions on my behalf because <laughs> right, right. now my business is going to be impacted by the decisions that they make. Yeah. And that's why I think that you'll see that shift. Mm. It's a much more of boutique type businesses where you someone say, hey, this is my business. And maybe yep. I've partnered with other men managers, you know, to do some best, some shared services, but ultimately it's my business. Well, I mean, this just the whole new industry has enabled, um, kind of the independence to thrive. I mean, we've seen that, you know, just at every level, but it's like traditionally even on, you know, you needed the major record label system, even just for distribution to move physical product. It was like those pipelines and those channels is what existed before. And now that's why so many independent artists are thriving is because you don't need the whole expensive infrastructure to get your music out to the public, you just need an internet connection, basically. And so, I mean, I think we are seeing, um, you know, kind of smaller boutique at every level from distribution to independent artists to indie label to managers to all of that. Um, every level is thriving in that in that smaller way. Um, so, well, yeah, I mean, it's it's a great time. So, for your artists right now, I mean, I I uh, to kind of bring it back around to the to the artists, like um, you know, Emily King, uh, she was nominated for a Grammy this last year. Two Grammys, yeah. Two Grammys this last yeah. year, right? And. It was, um, I mean, was that the first time that you worked with, uh, like, that kind of, I guess, well, with Culture Collective, that was your first couple of Grammy nominations? It was our first couple of Grammy nominations. We had Leon Thomas, uh, who's, who's a client, was nominated for production on Rick Ross and Drake's record, Gold Roses. Oh, okay. Um, um, but, yeah, it was it, it was great. I mean, listen, to that literally almost a year, because the Grammys were in February, so a year to launch. Yeah. We had two Grammy nominations with an artist that we worked with for a long time that was super supportive in, in yeah. the Launcher Culture Collective. Um, you know, and, and, you know, listen, much love to the clients that I work with that were, you know, that understood the vision that I had and started yeah. the company and that were willing to come with me. Right. And, and, and be a part of it. I mean, that's a leap of faith for everyone is mm -hmm. because it's like leaving this institution that has, you know, seemingly this um, infrastructure that can support what they're doing to kind of jump with you into this whole new realm. Yeah. 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 And I think, it, it, I think it's a testament to of artists wanting to, you know, they believed in what I was doing and that was driving their decision, hmm. the belief in what my vision was. Yeah, right. Cool. And I think that that that's gonna. And I, I spoke about that before. I think yeah. that's gonna manifest itself in this in this younger generation, where it's not just about working at a company to help build the resume. Those companies have to represent the values of what they mm. believe in as individuals. And yeah. I think you'll see that on the artist level too. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Well. Jonathan Azu, thank you so much thank for you. coming on the show. This is really it. great.